Welcome back to Pop Culture Explosion. I'm Mike, Kara, Paul, and Jeff. Here at Pop Culture Explosion, we follow the Prime Directive, we travel at warp speed, and we want you to live long and prosper. Kara, what are we talking about today? Star Trek. Star Trek. And guys, welcome Jeff back. You probably remember him from our Star Wars panel. He was so awesome that we brought him back to come again for Star Trek. Glad to be here. So today we're talking everything Star Trek. We're not going to be talking about just the movies, Next Generation, Voyager. We're talking about the franchise as a whole and really how it affects affected everything. So really, with that being said, guys, how did Gene Roddenberry, I mean, how does Star Trek affect pop culture over the past 40, 50 years. We don't have Star Wars without it, I believe. We don't, a lot of all the science fiction movies that came after it were all influenced by Star Trek. Yeah. 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 I also agree that they're, you know, they took a very unique cast. Um, it was the first time that there was, you know, an African American on the show, Russians, all these different type of people. And at that time, when it first aired, it, you know, wasn't normal. And I think now you see that so much. And I really believe that that's you know, was Star Trek. Technology, you know, there's been how much, you know, all the nerd scientists are constantly, you know, you know, coming out with theories of, you know, technology or whatever. How, I mean, how about culturally, though? I mean, in Star Trek, they... Uh, it created a huge nerd following. Well, I think, that's you know, where all the conventions. conventions came out of. You wouldn't have yeah. you wouldn't have a Comic Con if there yeah. wasn't Star Trek. I'm pretty sure you're right on that one. Probably one of the biggest things I think in the original Star Trek is when Uhura kissed Kirk. That was the first black white kiss on TV. I mean, Gene Roddenberry, I think he was pushing the envelope on yeah. race and racism, uh, on different cultures and how they all merge together. And I mean, you hit it right there. I mean, there was an African American woman on this on this set. There was a Russian, uh, a drunk Scott. <laughs> I mean, but it, it's exactly right because Gene Roddenberry, one of the things that I think he wanted to do is tell like a lot of um, cri a critique of what was going on in America at the time, the injustice and different political themes. And if he set the show in current America, people who I don't think would be would have been receptive to it, but setting it as a science fiction story in outer space kind of, I think, opened up some of that dialogue oh, he would allow it to be on TV yeah. at the time yeah. Yeah. yeah well I think that we have to take into account that you know the first original series only lasted three, three. seasons yeah. you know people didn't know how to take it I mean here you are pushing the limit not only on you know the culture side but the technology side too and people had a hard time getting into it it was that fan base that really brought it back up. And, and that, that, that leads me to the next question. Star Trek was only, the original Star Trek was only three, three seasons, yet it spawned Next Generation, Enterprise, Voyager, Deep Space Nine. So, so with all, and, and let's not forget about what, the 12, 13 movies, 12 movies? 12 movies that came out after this. Um, we'll just go in order, real quick. Mike, what was your favorite series? Favorite series, Next Generation. That's what I grew up on. Why? Why is it your favorite? Because you grew well, up with well, it. Well, that's I grew up on it. That's what I would come home from school and watch Next Generation. So that's how I got into it. You know. I had a crush on Kate McFadden. <laughs> <laughs> no, Beverly Crusher, biggest crush on her ever. Um, well, uh, Kara, what, who's your favorite? Uh, Next Generation. Mine was that was what my dad watched. So I would come home and my dad would be watching it, and that's kind of how I got involved in Star Trek to begin with. Mm -hmm. So. I think the first time you dive into it, you kind of have a love for those characters, and even though the other seasons are great, that was my first real experience with them. See, uh, mine was Voyager. Uh, I, I love Cat. Yeah, I love Catherine Janeway. Love the fact that you have this small crew, this small ship. You're mocking me so bad. No, no, I was just thinking of the Artemis episode. Oh, okay. oh know, yeah. The best captain. We all know Jane Jane Well, the fact that they're in the Delta Quadrant, they're battling the Borg, they're battling all these different races, they're all by herself, and she never loses her moral compass. When there were several opportunities where she could have broken her own rules and got the crew back sooner. How Jeff. many seasons was that? Was that five? I think or seven. Or Off the top of my five. head, I'm thinking, say, well, it was like seven episodes, or seven seasons. Seven. 
Well, I started in the like, mid-70s with the original series and on reruns, and they came out with action figures for it at the time, but I, I'd say Next Generation was probably overall my favorite show. Uh, I remember, so you, we all have our favorite shows. Was there an emotional thing that really just, what was a tearjerker for you, that really pulled at your heartstrings? A moment, do you recall? I'll give you mine real quick. When Janeway finally got back to the back to earth you know and she's greeted with all the different uh st starships and then tom paris's uh baby was born and you hear the baby crying in the background yeah i shed a tear too at that moment was, was there ever a moment like that for you guys um, i think when spock died and they played amazing grace as they shot his oh my goodness <laughs> off and out in space. a million geeks cried that day <laughs> Any, any moment for you guys at all? Not really. And there doesn't need to be one, it's okay. I think the only moment that really stood out for me was actually in the movies when they did the Humpback Whales, when they went in to save it, and you got to hear like all of the music and stuff like that. It was just very surreal for me. I just remember that very vividly, and I went out and bought it like right afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you know, there was um, in Next Generation, I think it's uh, All Good Things. It was the, the, the series finale. You know, the, the the crew, the bridge crew were playing poker. And Picard just walks right in. He looks at them, he's like, can I join you? And they're like, you're always welcome. He sits down, I'm getting chills right now just talking about it. And, and he's like, he just looks at them and he's like, I should have done this a long time ago, you know, and and I never saw Picard with regrets. In that moment, I saw a regret. That's why I like that series the most. The Next Generation. I think the the characters were really developed. Yeah, and yeah. they got to know and them. They had more time. Yeah, there was like seven seasons. Yeah, they, they had really a lot of time. Yeah. And it's fun to watch the original episodes and see how they're all so stiff, you know, with each other, and you know, and then you can see how they kind of get more comfortable with their roles and stuff as the series goes on. You know, I want to. Well, this isn't written. I'm just throwing this out there. So we're talking about the different seasons. We have the J.J. Abrams last three Star Treks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, first thoughts. I'm assuming you guys have all watched them. Yes. What What did you think of them, Jeff? I like them. I mean, I I think they're entertaining and on their own. Yeah. You guys. Well, I I would. <laughs> I'm almost kind of more curious to hear what you have to say. All right, well, let me think. Um, they're decent enough movies. I just don't feel Star Trek from them. Exactly. You know, I don't feel that. I don't know. So I'm not a huge fan of those. I, I just, they're decent movies, but. I, I, it looks like a Star Trek movie. I thought that, I thought the casting was brilliant. No, they, just, yeah, spot on. I just, I didn't. It didn't feel like a Star Trek movie, uh, and I don't like the fact that they destroyed Vulcan and destroyed the entire timeline. That that really kind of just bugged me. I mean, the only the, the criticism I would have about it is what turned me off to the latest one was them playing the Beastie Boys sabotage or whatever. <laughs> I was like, what? And then um, I'm going blank here, but. Dr. McCoy, I want to say, it just seems like he's trying to do an impression of Dr. McCoy. The yeah, it Kevin. wasn't. It just seems forced. Yeah. To me. So when I see that and I see the Beastie Boys jamming, I'm just like, what is this? Uh, I, I, I haven't even seen the last one. The their responsibility is to make is to make money. That's their responsibility, and I, I think that they kind of change it up a bit because I think Nemesis, the last Star Trek movie, just didn't perform all that well. So we have to think that you have someone like J.J. Abrams, 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 uh, like going through and and producing those, and he is known to be somewhat kind of out there and crazy with his, you know, design. So to to pull in this alternate timeline, so to speak, switch what we've known so long as Star Trek, you know, and like a lot of things that happened to Captain Kirk originally happened in the series to Spock. So when you go into it, you have this idea of you know what you know and you. Love, and I think that's why we lose that feeling is because they've kind of switched it and it's a very new you know experience for us I think that again you're right the casting on this was phenomenal um, bones is definitely one of my favorite characters love him um, in almost everything but I think that they kind of did lack in that bringing the the wow factor I, I think Christopher Pine did a great job as, as Kirk yes. uh, I, beautiful man well I'm glad you feel that way <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right <laughs> um, and the, the, the very first Star Trek where you know he finally comes out as Captain Kirk on the bridge he stands there and gives this look 
Hulk. I'm like, oh my God, that, that's Kirk. You know, so there are good things about the movies. I just I just wish they would have done just a little bit better. I like the tribute that they did give to Leonard Nimoy. I thought that they handled that very respectfully. That was, yeah. They did a really good job mm -hmm. in that that moment. Uh, we kind of touched on this during the, uh, the pop culture piece, but uh, we look at technology that we have today. I mean, uh, Gene Roddenberry had to have been a visionary. I mean, he, I mean, he created technology that eventually happened 20, 30 years later. I mean, just name a few of them. Uh, some of the so, like FaceTime. FaceTime, yeah, FaceTime. Yeah. cell phones. Virtual reality. Yeah. 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 And then the fact that I think he, he, he helped us actually want to reach for the stars as well. Yeah, anybody who's been in the space program, I imagine, like the, the shuttle crews and NASA, mm -hmm. I'm sure if you asked them, they probably would say, what's your, what was your influence? They would say Star Trek. And one of the shuttles was actually named Enterprise. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of scientists right now that are actually still working on things like a laser pointer and a bunch of the technology that they had in Star Trek that they just haven't yet been able to, you know, warping for one example <laughs> or, teleportation. or teleportation, teleportation. Well, they want are to actively send, working on yeah. this to this day if, yeah. they, if we want to send people to mars i mean we're going to have to figure something out <laughs> probably take something from star trek right here. Yeah. hey episode uh, star trek episode 241 <laughs> that was a good technology yeah there is a new star trek series coming out next year called uh, star trek discovery uh apparently it's 10 years before the original star trek episode or Star Trek series uh, hosted by CBS. What do you guys think? Are you excited about this? Do we want this? I, it's a television show, so I'll I can watch it. it. Yeah. I mean, give it a chance. Yeah, I'm surprised it's coming on CBS, though. I'm a little Wait for Netflix. No way for Netflix. Um, yeah. Season one hits Netflix. I'll watch it. I mean, CBS is very censored, and it's probably going to be somewhat of a prime time slot. And you have to kind of wonder, like, mm, how mm. are they going to get all the drama and excitement? Stuff that and does well now, like Netflix, is pretty harsh. That's for true. Uh, it doesn't happen. Well, like like Stranger Things wasn't that harsh. No, not at all. I don't see that. Well, a little bit about it. It's uh, it's going to be on CBS. It's going to be premiering May 2017, but there's rumors it might get pushed back a couple months after that. And the name of the ship is USS Discovery. So keep an eye out for that. Um, Side note: Are they going to bring in the people from the movie since this is no, this no? Is it's going to it's going to be a whole brand new cast. Yeah, it's a new cast. brand new cast. Um, so, there has been one common th thread through the entire Star Trek franchise, and that's the Prime Directive. Matter of fact, um, Robert Beltran, who played uh, Chakotay in Voyager, referred to the Prime Directive as being fascist in an article that I read a couple weeks ago. And I, my first thought is he doesn't know what fascism means, but uh, that's besides the point. So, is the Prime Directive good, bad, and different? Is it necessary? Is it, I mean... So not involving yourself in like another uh, species or another... Um, and and prime, like, prime How would that be fascist? Well, yeah, like I said, that's what he said, okay? I, I don't think it is at all. Um, the Prime Directive is really directed towards civilizations that have not achieved warp speed yet. Okay. They're below. They're, They're yeah. technologically below. Correct. So once a, once a species achieves warp speed, that's when the Federation will come in and get involved with them and stuff like that. But um, there, there is that one scene in the, the Star Trek episode where I think it was Star Trek... Um, was it two or one? I forget. I'm sorry. Where they're in the volcano, spots yeah. in the volcano, mm -hmm. and they save the planet from being yeah. destroyed. And technically, per the Prime Directive, they weren't supposed to do that. They should have let the culture and the, uh, the planet take it. On its own. And if it means the planet gets destroyed, the planet gets destroyed. I mean, sh they have this technology. If they could save a civilization from being destroyed by natural causes, should they? prevent them from being saved or save them. So you can't, you can't mess with the timeline, so to speak. Well, that's, not, that's, that's, that's messing with the advancement, the, the, the progression of the culture and the planet. It's a moral dilemma, and I right. think that's why it's it's throughout the whole series, and it just keeps coming back to that, because it is, well, yeah, it drives it everything. Drama. 
The drama, right? Yeah. And that's kind of what I mean by the timeline. I mean, you you have these people who have to kind of find things on their own, and if you don't, you know, it's kind of survival of the fittest, almost. Like, are you supposed to get involved? No, and I think that they kind of have to travel that timeline on their own. Okay, you know, I, I for one, the only thing I like about the Prime Directive is it sets it in stone. It, it's not objective. So you can't make this exception today and then say, well, I'm not going to make this exception. Well, wait a second. You did the exact same thing for these people. Why wouldn't you do it for these? So with that being said, it does add some consistency. But you know what, though? I'll never be in that spot. Well, I'll have to practice the Prime Directive. So <laughs> yay for me. So uh, final thoughts on Star Trek. I know. Kara, how about you? I'm a huge fan all the way around. I would recommend it to everybody. It's definitely got a lot of history and a lot of value, and you kind of have to commit to watching these series, though. Um, but each one brings something new and something exciting, and you know. And Star Trek is like a big menu. You can choose different things too. Right. Um, Jeff, I, I go back to with Star uh, Star Trek, how it's a little bit different than Star Wars. Because Star Trek is actually where we could go. It's like. It's Earth, it's um, our future perhaps, whereas Star Wars is another galaxy and so there's more of a, I think, a connection with Star Trek in that way, but um, it's just a, an I idea of where we can go and what uh, like the human race is um, capable of. Yeah, well, guys, thank you very much. And you guys, thank you for watching. Uh, we covered this much of Star Trek. So in the comments below, do a shout out. I mean, what was your favorite franchise? What was your favorite episode, your favorite character? Uh, let's continue the conversation. And if you like this episode, hit the like button. If you have some friends, share it. And of course, if you have not done so, please subscribe. So with that being said, peace out.